Hello, my name is Cheryl Erickson and I'm the Indigenous Focused ECE instructor with Louis Riel Vocational College. Today in Understanding Children Through Observation, we're going to look at Chapter 5 and uh, I'll just share some information on narrative observations with you. But before we get started, just a reminder to read Chapter 5 as this video isn't a replacement for your chapter readings. And so the term narrative observation, what does that mean? And, and basically it's just a, a written um, document uh, that tells a story. So it, it includes um, a sequence of events um, that maybe are happening in the environment or happening with a specific child that kind of tells a story. Uh, about the child uh, or within that program and so uh, it just gives you information on what is happening uh, whether it's a behavioral uh, type of inf type of documentation again what happens before um, the actual event and after um, to best help you meet the needs of, of children within your program. And so these types of observations, uh, narrative observations, are again uh, based on facts uh, that are occurring at specific times um, and it's revi um, reliable evidence uh, that you can verify um, in your observations. So a lot of our observations that we're doing in, in the early years with children are based on narrative types of, of information. It is a really great way uh, to describe behaviors. Again, you're being uh, objective and uh, recounting that sequence of events um, from actual facts that are happening uh, in the moment. And uh, as the observer, you're recording uh, what a behavior is important. Um, and you're using uh, some type of um, narrative type of tool. And so when uh, we're talking about uh, children in specific and their behaviors and using narrative types of documentation, what kinds of um, um, documentations you're doing, what tools you're using, uh, can really help you as an ECE determine uh, where a child is developmentally. And so you can look at uh, tools that help you um, with um, looking at all developmental domains, so gross and fine motor, um, sensory, um, language development, self-help skills, problem solving, your play patterns that we've discussed earlier. It can help you define what interests a child for future program planning. Um, if children are developing uh, social skills and have they developed empathy. And so again, we're looking at um, developmentally appropriate practices and developmental milestones. So that's just a few of the examples of how you can observe children or what types of observations you can do uh, to determine where the children are developmentally. And I've attached this developmental milestones tool uh, in, um, in uh, chapter four, I believe. And so this just gives you a glance of where children should be um, at developmentally um, for the different ages. So again, keep in mind that, you know, children are all developing um, uh, at their own rates. Um, development is, is kind of unique to, to all children. And so at, say for example, um, a year of age, um, most children do walk at 12 months, but that doesn't mean all children walk at 12 months. So there should be a progression um, when it comes to, say, walking. So children, before they walk, they learn to crawl, they learn to pull themselves up on furniture, and they can balance themselves and take a few steps. That's the progression to walking. So when we look at developmental milestones when we're observing children, we know that that they're developing developing normally because they've made those those different progressions that leads up to actually walking so we know that it's going to happen over a period of time but it might not happen as soon as they're one year of age so uh, it's important just to to look at um, those progressions when you're leading to uh, when you're doing those observations because that can be helpful uh, for you in your program planning um, for example, um, that 
progression to walking, um, how can you scaffold uh, that child? So can you take them by the hand and walk with them is a natural progression uh, in scaffolding and teaching them to, to take those steps uh, on their own. So that's just an example of, of how you can use uh, those developmental milestones to scaffold uh, further development for a child. A few of the different types of narrative observation tools could be a running record, anecdotal records, lear learning stories, and social stories. So you can utilize these tools. Um, you know, for example, a running record is going to be documentation that you do, and it's going to be an ongoing uh, type of record where you're continually adding to it. Um, and so again, uh, when I say that running record and adding to it, uh, for example, um, you're going to have a specific type of behavior or reason why you're um, documenting, which is really important. And um, that running record will end when you have sufficient, um, sub sufficient um, data um, to help you in your, in your tool. Anecdotal records are often used as well on a daily basis and will document things, for example, you know, how, a children, how children are eating or how children are sleeping. And again, that could be something that you're doing uh, on a daily basis uh, that uh, is there to support um, um, the child. It's there for family information and coworker information as well. So you're wanting to see um, a progression as well uh, in children and in their development or you're monitoring uh, maybe sleep times or if there's issues with with eating that helps you uh, uh, maybe identify um, you know uh, e eating patterns or it could be related to the times of your meals maybe they're too close together but you're kind of trying to figure out information uh, that's best helpful to that child. Um, learning stories and social stories are really uh, good tools as well um, because you can have some concrete information, you're documenting pictures and data, um, and that, that's great information to share uh, with children and for families as well. Um, I have uh, attached just uh, uh, some tools that you can utilize as far as uh, narrative um, documentation and so again um, you know when you look at these types of documentations we want to uh, ensure that we're being professional in how we're documenting this information and so um, I want you to just take a look at different ways um, you can look at the documents to ensure that they are professional and that they are um, doing um, I guess that they are purposeful to your observations. So when we look at this documentation, I want you to, to look at, you know, are you seeking permission? Um, are you being not non-judgmental? Are you giving specific detail? Um, what is the reason why you're observing? Is it flowing? Is it, is it allowing you to uh, put in that information that sequences of events that's telling a story because that's how you're going to figure out um, you know if this observation tool is working if it's going to give you sufficient data uh, to help you reflect and uh, help you create a uh, tool to um, perhaps um, figure out why maybe a behavior is occurring and problem solve, uh, figure out a program plan to uh, change the behaviors. So it, it, it is, uh, you know, uh, there are different tools that you're going to use. Uh, this is one example of an observation. Uh, again, you know, dated, um, uh, the age of the child is going to be really important because you want to make sure you're your developmental, uh, developmentally appropriate practices uh, coincide with that age of the child. Uh, how long are you observing? Um, and again, it's going to be uh, different uh, sequences of events. Um, so in conclusion uh, to uh, this chapter, there is a video. Please take the time to review that video. If you do have any questions regarding the chapter reading, 
uh, or the video, please do see your instructor as well as check in to ensure you haven't missed any handouts or assignments pertaining to this chapter. Hello and welcome to part one of anecdotal records and checklists. This is a two-part series. Um, in this session and the next session, focuses on using anecdotal records and checklists to collect and interpret child observation and assessment information. Anecdotal records and checklists are very effective, commonly used methods for determining and tracking children's progress. The information gathered with these strategies is used to improve instruction in children's learning. Hopefully, and during this session, you will increase your knowledge and your skills in writing anecdotal records, recording information using checklists, and analyzing and understanding anecdotal information in checklists. We will be doing and utilizing anecdotal records and checklists on several of our assignments through the semester. So this and the next session will provide a baseline for doing that. So during this session, um, you will be able to define anecdotal records with regard to child observation and assessment, explain how to collect anecdotal records, use an activity matrix to collect anecdotal records, define checklists with regard to child observation and assessment, explain how to use the checklist, and use a checklist to document child assessment data. There's a number of different ways to collect information about what you see and hear children doing. Anecdotal records, checklists, work samples, and video. In the first two sessions on collecting and synthesizing information, you'll learn about using anecdotal records and checklists to record your observations. The session also covers how to analyze and understand the information you have gathered. Work sampling and using video is the topic of a later session. Okay, so let's go ahead and just dig into anecdotal records. Writing anecdotal records is one useful way to collect child assessment information. Simply put, an anecdotal record is a written record of what children do or say during an everyday activity. Is this a method that you've already observed in classrooms, particularly early childhood classrooms? So you're going to view a video that shows what collecting and using anecdotal notes looks like in a classroom. I want you to listen carefully um, so that we can discuss a little bit after the video, but in particularly, in par excuse me, in particular, I want you to think about why the teachers in the video record what children are doing and saying how the teachers in the video decide what to record, and what the teachers in the video do to make it easy to record their observations. Just jot down those things as you watch this clip. Okay, so think for a moment about what you heard from the classroom teachers in the video. What did the teachers in the video what did the teachers in the video explain about why they record what children are doing and saying? What did the teachers in the video explain about how they decide what to record? And what did the teachers in the video suggest to make it easy to record observation? How do you currently record ongoing child assessment? about children in a program. What's some things that you have seen um, or things that have you've seen but don't work so well? Often teachers find it easier to record anecdotes at times when they're not busy interacting with children and they use other opportunities for this valuable type of systematic observation. Examples include observing children as they play or work in centers with intermittent adult interaction, recording notes while another team member engages in teacher interactions, and recording anecdotes based on video clips. Several basic elements should be included in an anecdotal record. 
Anecdotal recording is a strategy for documenting behavior in which observers write down key information about what they see or hear children doing. You write down the date and time. It's important to vary the times of observations as some children may do best at certain times of the day. You want to observe children's behavior over time, not just once, in order to monitor progress. You want to write down the setting. Observe children's skills during different activities as they participate in varied learning areas. Children sometimes do better in a particular location or during a particular activity type. Lastly, give a description of what you observed. And most importantly, it must be objectively stated what you see or hear. The next slide offers some tips for writing objective descriptions. It's important to be objective so that notes are as accurate and valid as possible. Guard against allowing personal beliefs, feelings, or experiences to interfere with the objectivity. Focus on the curriculum areas and the child's goals being observed. Remember to be objective in what is documented in an anecdotal record. Write down facts rather than opinions or assumptions, and avoid making a judgment or guessing. Here's some tips about being sure anecdotal records are objective. Ask yourself, can I see it? Can I hear it? Would another person agree about what occurred? To be accurate, observations should be recorded right away or as soon as possible to guard against forgetting. Notes must be accurate as they will be used to make important instructional decisions. What can you do to be sure that you record observations promptly in your classroom? This is an example of an anecdotal record. The date, time, and setting are included. October 4th at 9.20 in the morning at the snack table. The description is objective and focuses on curriculum areas being observed. The note shows Fran's progress in the area of expressive language. Fran said, please pass the crackers to request and, um, she needed them. Fran's progress in the fine motor skill area was also observed. She was able to use a knife for spreading and opening a small milk carton. Okay, let's move on to how to collect anecdotal records. It's important to be realistic about recording observations. Teachers cannot expect to be able to record everything that occurs in their program or classroom. They cannot expect to be able to record something about every child every day. The next several slides include helpful methods for recording and collecting observations. This slide shows one easy method for collecting anecdotal records or notes. Place a clipboard with notepaper or cards in various areas of the room. The teachers and assistants can write down their records as they observe children. When writing materials are available where they are likely to be needed, it is easier to pause for a moment to note what children are doing and saying. The presence of paper or note cards also serves as a reminder to document observations. Here's another way to collect anecdotal records. The teacher and aide use sheets of labels to write down their observations of children's behavior. Each column of labels is used for a different domain in the Head Start Child Development and Early Learning Framework. The children's names are pre-printed to remind teachers to observe each child in every area. After class, the labels are placed in the individual child's portfolio or binder. An important advantage of this recording method is that the pre-printed labels make it easier for teachers to tell whether notes have been collected about all children in all domains. This example shows one way to use labels, but they could be used more like post-it notes without pre-labeling with names and domains. The labels on the left have been prepared for recording anecdotes about each child in the social-emotional knowledge and skills domains. The same labels are shown on the right after observations about each child in various domains have been added. Labels organized in this way may be used to gather assessment information about each child in each learning or development domain. 
This slide shows one additional suggestion. In this classroom, the teacher uses post-it notes. These could be placed in the areas of the room or they could be in teacher's pockets. Again, this makes it very convenient to write down notes while watching the children participate in the everyday classroom activities. Do you have any additional suggestions to share about making anecdotal record collection easy? Okay, so we're going to watch a video clip and write an anecdotal record based on the video clip, and then we're going to check the anecdotal record. Go ahead and play the clip and create your anecdotal record as you are observing. All right, moving on, anecdotal records using an activity matrix. We're going to come back to the anecdotal records that you created based off the video clip. Some children in the classroom may have highly individualized goals and objectives that require very frequent collection of assessment information. For example, some children with IEPs or behavior support plans may need data collected on a weekly or even daily basis. This classroom activity matrix can help the teaching team plan who and what to observe. The names of the children being observed are written across the top of the matrix. The classroom schedule of activities is written down the side. Each individual's objective is written in a space that tells the teaching team when to observe. They can then write the anecdotal notes on the matrix, perhaps on post-it notes. They transfer the information they gather into a child's portfolio or their classroom's assessment system. Moving on to checklists. Recording information using checklists is another useful way to collect child assessment information. A checklist is a list of specific skills and behaviors arranged in logical order that represent curricular domains or objectives. Have you ever used a checklist in a classroom? Teachers deliberately observe what children do or say, and then they record progress by jotting them down in the presence or absence of skills. A list of skills on which to record child's accomplishments is a checklist. Okay, you're going to watch a video showing what using checklists looks like in the classroom and outdoors. Okay, so take a moment and think about what you heard from the classroom teachers in the video. What did the teachers in the video explain about why they use checklists to record children's skills? And what did the teachers in the video explain about why they decide which skills to include? What did the teachers in the video suggest about team members using checklists while they interact with children? The information gathered by using teacher-made checklists, along with the data from strategies like anecdotal recording and work sampling, is often used to determine ratings on a program, a program's chosen assessment in instrument, such as the high scope child observation record um, or a work sampling system. So take a second and think what did the teachers do to explain how they decided which skills to use on the checklist? Using checklists can be an easy way to document and collect data on skills that children are developing in the classroom. Teachers can create their own checklists to represent specific domains that fit the needs of individual children. For example, a teacher could create a checklist for monitoring the progress of learning numbers. By creating a well-developed checklist, a teacher can easily check off numbers that children identify, which will help the teacher determine whether or not progress has been made.
Before creating checklists, teachers need to consider which skills are important to assess and which of these skills fit well with using a checklist. Checklists are used to document progress towards specific skills and behaviors. Are children able to use utensils to eat? Do they hold books right side up and turn pages? Do children use words, phrases, or sentences to express themselves? Are children able to accurately count quantities of objects? Do dual language learners use English words to request items? You might use checklists to gather information about progress towards these specific skills. If you need qualitative information about how children perform skills, consider using other assessment strategies instead. Then, teachers need to know how to plan to record child progress on skill development. What will the checklist look like? Will the teacher monitor child progress weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly? Will the teacher organize the checklist by children's names of, or by learning objective? By answering these questions, teachers can develop checklists that fit the specific circumstances of their classroom. For instance, Teachers will want to determine what skills children are currently developing. Then they create checklists that reflect the learning curriculum of the classroom. Another practical suggestion, suggestion for using checklists is for the purpose of ongoing data collection. Because checklists allow teachers to easily mark whether or not a child has demonstrated a skill, checklists can be used in both small and large group activities to monitor multiple children's progress. We will discuss this later in the module on how data for these children can be easily organized and stored in paper or electronic files. Okay, so let's keep it simple and talk about using checklists. When using checklists for ongoing child assessment, it's important to try to keep it very simple. Figure out how you will systematically observe and document child progress towards meaningful goals. For example, you might consider recording information on checklists placed on clipboards around the classroom to facilitate easy access and to avoid missing assessment opportunities. This checklist, for example, was placed in the dramatic play area so that members of the teaching team could easily document abilities children demonstrated in the domains of social interaction and symbolic representation. This checklist was placed on a table where a small group classification activity was set up each week. The checklist is designed to measure children's classification skills. Classification skills are parts of patterns which fall under the mathematics knowledge and skills domain from the Head Start Child Development and Early Learning Framework. With some simple planning ahead of time, this checklist can be an easy way to observe how children are progressing on classification skills. With this checklist, the teacher uses buttons of different sizes and colors to monitor if children can organize buttons by size and color. The teacher checks the item when a child classifies them correctly and puts a line through the item if the child is incorrect. Checklists can also be used to monitor the progress of small groups of children who are working towards common goals. This checklist is used to monitor the progress of a small group of children who have been identified as needing extra help in literacy skills. They're learning the letters that make up their names. So this checklist was designed to monitor uppercase and lowercase letter identification. Letter identification is part of alphabet knowledge, which falls under the literacy knowledge and skills domain from the Head Start Child Development and Early Learning Framework. This is an easy checklist for teachers to use because the teachers can have children's names already listed on the checklist to record data each week. Finally, you will want to create checklists that are short, clear, and objective so they can be completed with ease. Some checklists ask users to record a simple yes or no to indicate whether each skill, milestone, knowledge objective, or early learning standard has been accomplished. 
Here's an example of a checklist that was created to monitor children prog children's progress on gross motor skill development. The teacher was specifically interested in evaluating whether or not children were able to throw, catch, and kick a ball. These skills fall under the physical development and health domain from the Head Start Child Development and Early Learning Framework. Based on what is shown here, the children have not mastered throwing, catching, and kicking a ball. Therefore, the teacher should continue to monitor the children's progress weekly until the children demonstrate these skills. Other checklists allow users to record the extent to which a skill has been achieved. For example, indicators of frequency like always, sometimes, or never, or quality might be used. Tallies are another recording method commonly used for checklists. So in this session, we talked about um, defining what an anecdotal record is with regard to child observation and assessment. We talked about how to collect anecdotal records. We talked about how to use an activity matrix to collect anecdotal records. We defined checklists with regard to child observation and assessment. We talked about how to use checklists with ease and how to use a checklist to document child assessment data. Mm -hmm.